Okay, we're going to look at theme 2A in the Christianity section of the course. Uh, this theme is entitled The Nature of God. There's two parts to it, and the first part is to consider Is God Male? And in particular, we are looking at the work of the theologian and eco feminist Sally McFaig. So, let's start with a general introduction and let's look at this concept. If you read the original languages of the Bible, so the Old Testament written in Hebrew, the New Testament written in Greek, you get this concept of God as a father, a male term. When we have the personal pronoun throughout the Bible, God is referred to as he. So there's little doubt that the writers of the Bible who lived in a male dominated society reflect, reflected that view in their writings. God is portrayed as male in the Bible. So we get quotes such as, God said, let us make man in our image, image in Genesis. The Lord works out everything for his own ends in Proverbs. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name in Matthew's gospel. Father, he said, everything is possible for you. And that's Jesus praying to God in Mark's gospel. Or Paul with this particularly sexist quote, I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man. She must be silent for Adam was formed first, then Eve. So that's looking at that patriarchy, that male dominated society. So we know that God's referred to father. Let's look at the other aspect of the Trinity. Let's look at Jesus. He's referred to as the son of God. He was clearly a man during his life on earth. However, Christians believe that before he was incarnate, he was with God and was God. So therefore, re-emphasizing that male aspect. So we get this quote from John's Gospel right at the beginning. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So clearly male. The word became flesh, made his dwelling among us. So making it clear that Jesus was God. God is male. And so it follows logically on. And the Holy Spirit, even though it's not directly referred to as masculine in the New Testament, in the Greek language, the pronouns that are generally used to refer to the uh, Holy Spirit uh, generally take the masculine form. So it is hinted at, although not directly said, that the Holy Spirit is more male than female in terms of how the language comes across in the Bible. Now, nevertheless, there are a small number of passages within the Bible that portray God in female terms, and they are small compared to the amount that portray him in male terms. So you could use this one from Isaiah, as a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. Or you could have this one, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you are not willing. There's Matthew's gospel. And this verse from the Psalms, I'm like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child, I am content. So you do have some feminine imagery for God, like a mother hen, like a mother comforting a child. So there is that, but as we can see, it's much more male dominated. However, Despite that, it's also made really clear that God is neither male nor female. Jesus himself said, God's spirit, John 4, 24. So it's also clear, <laughs> despite what Paul says in 1 Timothy, that God values both men and women alike. So here we have Paul again. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. Little contradictory there, Paul, compared to what you said in 1 Timothy, who am I to judge? So it's clear that God is neither male nor female, that men and women are equal. However, the language that is used to describe God in the Bible is so male dominated that perhaps we have got a skewed view of what God is really like. And that is what Sally McFaig sees. She believes that to be the case. There she is on the right hand side. So let's think about language about God. 
you've got a transcendent being that lives at an epistemic distance from us. When I mean epistemic distance, a distance in knowledge, we are unable to fully understand God. And we are using language to describe the indescribable. So we are always going to fall short. So as I've said here, language about God by definition is very different, you know, a very different being from us. You know, uh, you can't describe God. We can't say very much about him as we only know how to speak of things that we know from our own experience. So basically, all we can do when referring to God is use analogy. So say God is very similar to something or really like something else we do know, but only up to a point. So God's living and I, he really literally does have life, but not as we know it. Or you use metaphor, use a comparison, a figure of speech to highlight some attribute or, or aspect that both show in some way. God's a rock, you know, not literally, not in all respects, but solid, etc. Now, McFaig argues that we need to use the metaphor of God as mother to replace the metaphor of God as father. And she does this for a specific reason. She argues God's ultimately unknowable by us and that all language we use to describe something that is unknowable is provisional. And what she means by this is that the language is not defining. It's not giving us any truths about God. OK, so she would argue that God can't be defined as father. He only has some aspects of fatherliness. So using other metaphors reminds us that no single metaphor can be the truth about God. We can only have images, not definitions. Now, what she's saying there is the constant use of the male metaphors and male language have skewed that image of God. She admits we can't define what God is like, but we can get an image of what God may be like in our minds, and that is through metaphor. And the male metaphors have given an incorrect image. It has overemphasized one aspect of God, the maleness, at the cost of the femaleness. So she would argue that the use of father in scripture is culture dependent. It's very much rooted in the culture of the writers of the books of the Bible. The Bible writers are using metaphors as it expresses their experience of God in their day and age, but they were writing in an ancient, ancient patriarchal culture that subjugated women. And she says, well, that was 2000 odd years ago, you know, for some of the Old Testament books, 4000 odd years ago. Slightly under, actually. That writing is totally dependent on the culture that it was in. Now, in the year 2020, when I'm doing this PowerPoint, culture has changed. Women are equal to men. They are no longer seen as the weaker sex. They are no longer subjugated in vast quantity, in vast areas of the world, although it's not perfect yet. You'd be the first to admit. So McVeigh is saying, well, why don't we express our experience of God in the way that the writers would today? So we aren't culturally dependent. So we think about writing about for today's society and her argument is that the use of God as mother is would go some way to correcting some of that imbalance. So but for McFaig there's some real problems with the male God language for want of a better word. She would argue that it promotes a patriarchal culture and if it's promoting a patriarchal culture you're subjugating women. But of course, today we're all equal, no one's superior. She would also say it's dominating quite often, and certainly throughout the Old Testament, you get this view of God as a king or a father. And traditionally, kings and fathers issue orders. They expect obedience, fear or submission. We don't live like this anymore, McFaig would argue. She would argue that the male dominated view of God is personal and intervening. So kings and fathers act to rescue us, save us, help us. But the modern scientific world for McFaig rejects this kind of divine intervention. It just doesn't happen. She would also argue that it leads to passivity. Kings hand out benefits or punishments to their subjects who only need to wait on their pleasure. But today, 
McFaig argues, we know we're the ones who are responsible for our world. We have the power even to destroy nature. So nuclear uh, power, overconsumption, etc. Remember, she's an eco-feminist. So not only is she concerned with um, equal rights for women, but also for caring for the planet. I'll do a little bit more of that in a slide in a minute. So she would also say that this view of male dominated metaphor, etc., is distance. You know, this idea of a king, a father, royalty is untouchable. Fathers are out there somewhere doing things. And it's rule obedience centered. You know, the king's fathers lay down the law. They expect obedience. Justice is punishing those who rebel against that law. But she would say it's better to see godlike living as showing care and fairness for the well-being of all, as opposed to just laying down the law and blindly obeying it. And she'd finally say it's anthropocentric. So king and father metaphors are focused on human society. But for her, that's a real issue because that excludes, that metaphor excludes the rest of creation. And as I said here, remember, she's an eco-feminist, someone who's interested in both the environment and women's rights. And uh, lastly, it's just oppressive based on law, fear, justice, rather than care, relationship and mutual responsibility. So she wants to change. So. Really important to remember, McFaig is not saying that God is a mother or even female, but she's saying that the image of God, the earth mother, highlights characteristics of God, such as love for the world. And these are better characteristics than the ones that are conjured up by the male view. So she develops a metaphor as the world as being God's body. And this is linked to her eco-feminist um, eco view. And she develops that metaphor further for God's relationship with the world. And she corresponds that to the three parts of the Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Three ethical elements and three different, different definitions of love. And we're using the Greek definitions here. So these are summed up in this table that I've got for you here. So for the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, McFaig uses the metaphor mother, lover and friend. And she's saying the ethical element highlighted by the mother is justice, by the lover is healing and by the friend is companionship. And the word for love that's linked to the mother is agape, that selfless love, the type that God has for the world, eros, which is more the desire, the way in which the God's love works in the world, and philos, companionship, the way in which humans should interact with the world. So have a close look at that. You need to know that for the exam. So really make sure you understand those three key concepts that McFaig is putting forward. So McFaig believes that masculine language regarding you know, God's unilateral sovereign rule as a king has led to an abuse of the natural world and the domination of women by men, ecofeminism. So she says that if God's called mother, it follows the world is no longer ruled over by God. It becomes more of a part of God's body or womb. So to harm nature, is to harm God because the world is part of God. Now this is pantheism, the belief that the universe is a visible part of God. Not all Christians are happy with this. So the maternal images of God, birthing, comforting and caring for McFaig highlight humanity's reliance on God. And this is key. McFaig stresses the importance of seeing God in female and not feminine terms, because the female is specifically referring to gender, whereas feminine refers to qualities that are traditionally associated with, with women. They're stereotypes, the idea of, I don't know, caring, loving, you know, compassionate, 
they're not just female, uh, they're not just feminine qualities, they're also masculine qualities, but they have been traditionally ascribed to the feminine. Female is much more about things that only a female can do, give birth, etc. Okay, feed the young, suckle the young, want the young to flourish, those sort of things. So please, when you are referring to McFaig's views, stress that she wants the female and not the feminine, because we don't want stereotypes, which is what she's fighting against. So here's her argument for the metaphor as God as mother. She says, right, if you use mother instead of father, it's intimate. You get this idea of God nurturing, just as a mother nurtures, sharing their life, their physical life with us, fulfilling needs, drawing us into union with them. That is a better view of the divine for McFaig. It's related to us. If creation is bodied forth, if the world emerges from God as God's body, this better shows our dependence and relatedness to God because God then knows creation from the inside, almost as part of herself, as opposed to this sort of transcendent out there above it all God. She would argue this metaphor is more focused on fulfillment of all than on obedience. She would argue that mothers care more about growth, flourishing, fulfillment of their offspring. So that side of God is emphasized more with the mother metaphor. It's inclusive. A mother cares for all that she gives birth to as her own. It's all creation, not just humans made in his image. Now, if you think about that first um, Genesis chapter one, when God makes man in his own image and tells man to rule. Let's think about the um, environment for a moment. We've got this idea that man rules and therefore can do what he wants with the environment. For McFaig, this idea that all creation, not just humans, are made in the image of God means that the environment must be respected. Remember, eco-feminist. So she would say it reflects better that we're in God's image, and that follows on from the previous point. God's both male and female, not just motherhood, but other aspects of the femaleness of a femaleness must be in God, all other aspects. Now, there have been some responses to McFay because not everyone agrees with her. And the first type of response is related to the idea of her argument for metaphor and language. And so some Christians might argue when you look at that uh, description of God in the Bible, it's not language, it's revelation. It's God speaking directly. So if you've got your fundamental Christians, if you go, you know, Ken Ham in Answers in Genesis, every single word of this book is 100 percent the word of God. There are no errors. So they would argue that McFaig's argument assumes that language about God is a human invention. Well, it isn't. It comes from divine inspiration and therefore you've got no right to change it. So let's think about that. Jesus related to himself to God as his father. He taught his disciples to pray our father, to see themselves as children of the father. Jesus was counterculture in a lot of things. You know, he had women disciples yet with sinners, but despite that counterculturalism, he didn't think God really was a father. If he didn't think God was really a father, why did he make, why did he make such a point of it? There you go, McFaig. Secondly, they say the Bible only ever speaks of God as father, even though in religious cultures of the ancient Near East, it was common to think of God in forms of goddesses. So Greek goddesses, Roman goddesses, Assyrian goddesses, Israel, we read about this in the Old Testament, was often tempted to do this and prophets spoke against it. So in keeping to God as father, actually, Israel was going against Near Eastern culture. So Israel itself, the whole of the Old Testament, is countercultural, which combats that view of McFakes. And when thinking about those verses that do uh, emphasize the motherly aspect or the female side of God, they would argue that the Bible never suggests that it's female mother imagery about God actually makes God a mother. So although the aspects are important and belong to God as father, the Bible never suggests God could be seen as female. So 
for instance, if we look at Numbers 11, 12, the Bible has Moses asking if he, if God gave birth to his people. So there's a mother image, but this doesn't question his gender identity. He's still very much seen as male and the father. The second view that you can argue back at with Fagon is creation is better explained with God as father. Remember, she thinks that creation is better explained with God as mother, this idea of God birthing uh, the universe. Now, this little tricky, so let's make sure we get our heads around it. So this argument against McFaig is that creation is something distinct from God, yet expressive of him and cared for by him. God is over and above it, so he's transcendent. So God as father shows God as transcendent, above and beyond creation, and imminent at the same time acting within it. God as mother only suggests God is in continuity with creation, creation is part of him. So actually all you have there is the imminent side of God and by viewing God as mother and God birthing the, uh, birthing the universe out of him and it being a part of him, actually you've lost that transcendence. So the father metaphor for people argue against McFaig on the creation being better explained by a father God, they would say it's better at showing God as the origin and the source of everything because we use the analogy fathers initiate procreation which is then separate from them. So the man for want of a cruder word leaves a deposit and then walks away if necessary the mother receives the life, nurtures it and gives birth for it. The man is not required after the insemination. So there's a better analogy for God creating the universe and then leaving it and being transcendent above it and acting every now and again within it as he chooses, like a father. And thirdly, um, they would argue that God as father better reveals God's identity, who God really is. So um, the father metaphor, they would say, shows us that God's both omnipotent and benevolent, whereas the mother God suggests imminence, continuity of creation, and loses, as I said previously, that sense of power, transcendence and mystery. Um, the father aspect shows that God has full patriarchal authority, of which earthly fatherhood is only a pale reflection. So you may have dominating distant earthly fathers, but that doesn't mean the analogy is wrong. As father, God cares for us individually with a personal love. So there's nothing wrong with that. And then, of course, we come back to the aspect of the Trinity. The Trinity defines God as father. Jesus is the son. So the father son metaphor better keeps the sense of how Jesus is distinct from the father, yet the father's the source. In his human nature, Jesus sees God as his father, although he has no earthly father. So the analogy works better. And then also to change the metaphor of God as father, some people would argue is to change who God is. Now, there's no God apart from God the father, yet he does have female qualities. So it's been so entrenched that changing the metaphor would change worship of God and the key beliefs of what Christians believe in. Not sure that's a strong argument, but nevertheless it could be used. So God as father, analogy or metaphor. This is the final slide. This sums it all up. And I think perhaps the final argument and perhaps you could argue the most conclusive one against McFaig. So if you take God as father, many scholars think you can argue from the point, the view of both analogy and metaphor. So in analogy, God really is a father. He's got the fullness of patriarchal authority and care beyond that, you know, beyond what we can even know, epistemic distance, etc. And metaphor works because God's literally not like human fathers. You need a corresponding female, other to impregnate in order to give life. He's not literally men in a sexual way, but he shares some features of human fatherhood. So analogy and metaphor work. If you go with God as mother, they would argue that actually you can't use analogy. And this is why. So let's run with metaphor first. 
So we go with the metaphor, God shares motherhood aspects such as care, inclusive love, nurturing of all creation, etc., just as McFay points out. However, God's not a human mother in all respects because mothers don't begin life. They receive and nurture it. And what God creates is distinct from himself, while for mothers, the child's part of their body while in the womb. So creation is not part of the same stuff as God is, so they reject pantheism. But for those very reasons, and we use analogy here, God cannot li literally be mother because of the points above. Because God literally does not begin life and creation is not literally part of God. So therefore only metaphor works, which weakens McFaig's point of view. So you've got the arguments for and against McFaig, which you can use in your evaluation, and you've got the key views of McFaig. I hope you found that useful.